It's finally inauguration day after what felt like a 400-year presidential term. Woo! We'll all be celebrating Trump's departure, but his supporters don't seem like they're going anywhere. My guest today is R.J. Eskow, who has been taking a deep look at how our media and political systems have left us completely blind to the conditions this country gave rise, uh, how we gave rise to the radical right. R.J., thanks for joining us. Always a pleasure talking to you, Juliana. All right. If you don't know RJ's show, get on it right now. It is called The Zero Hour. It's on Free Speech TV. It's syndicated on radio. You can watch parts of it on YouTube. He, by the way, you, by the way, were the chief writer and editor for the 2016 Bernie Sanders campaign. And... Indeed, I was. And what? And That's... Fortune 500 healthcare executive, student activist, yeah. all kinds of stuff. And writer. And writer. And friend of mine in the media world. Indeed. It's yeah. nice to see you. Nice to see you. I, it's nice to celebrate today with you. Can you talk about like what's on your mind as we go through the peaceful transfer of power? Possibly not peaceful, but I'm putting it out there in my mind. Uh, from Donald Trump to Joe Biden, now that it's happening. What are you looking out for as Biden becomes president? Well, first of all, that helicopter liftoff was... The happiest moment of the last four years, politically speaking. I, uh, I'm i old enough to remember Nixon's helicopter lifting off from the White House lawn. This was even better. So uh, I haven't been this much a fan of helicopter flights since I got one for my 13th birthday. And uh, this was just as much fun as that one. In terms of Biden, look, you know, I'm a journalist, but I'm also an activist. And as an activist, uh, I'm looking to see how uh, movement activism will energize the next four years and how receptive the Biden administration will be to pressure from the left. I'm a guy who wants to see a significantly reshaped society and economy from the one we live in now. I don't expect that from the Biden administration, but I do expect uh, to see us pressuring them to do everything possible in the parameters of their system to relieve suffering and make life better for people. So, you know, we'll see how it goes. I'm excited today because I just did a report on how the, one of the first things he's planning on doing, I mean, I think Biden's going to spend his entire, you know, first day, first day signing executive orders and paperwork, but one of the things he said he was going to do is rescind the federal permit for the Keystone XL pipeline, right. which clearly right. would not be happening had it not been for the indigenous led on the ground um, right. activists that have been activism that's been happening. Right. No, there's no question about it. And if the left hadn't been hammering the Democrats for 10 years uh, about the need to do more to rein in Wall Street, we wouldn't be seeing Gary Gensler uh, appointed uh, as head of the SEC, who's a you know a pretty good guy. We wouldn't see Rohit Chopra, who is a very good guy, uh, apparently about to be named as director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So we're seeing some good things. Uh, you know, some things I'm not so crazy about, especially in the foreign policy and military areas. But but. The good things we're seeing are the results of the pressure that the left has been bringing to bear. And therefore, look, if Biden exceeds our expectations, we'll keep the pressure up. If he doesn't meet our expectations, we'll keep the pressure up. That's that's my attitude. Anyway. Do you think that he learned from being vice president under Obama, you know, that a uh, sort of a he's always talking about healing etc which i agree with i think we definitely need it in fact last night i i started crying when i was watching that moment of um it was like a beautiful moment when they were he and uh, kamala harris were at the reflecting pool and they had a moment of silence and a remembrance for the people who've died from the coronavirus it was like the first moment of humanity that we've had in four years i thought it was beautiful and I lost yes, track. I did too. And, you know, he's a very human guy as a person. He's operated his whole life in a political system that I think needs significant change. But it, it may be that it, since he has nowhere else to go, he's reached the pinnacle of, you know, the game that he's in. It may be that he'll 
feel more free uh, to express that kind of compassion and policy. That's my hope mm-hmm. that uh, that he'll feel more free to do that than his predecessors have felt, and uh, maybe even bring an end to the sort of uh, centrist democratic politics. But that's not going to happen without uh, considerable pressure at every level uh, on the Democratic Party. So, uh, look, I, I find him a likable guy, uh, but I'm not going to let up on the pressure. I, I no, just, we definitely I, cannot do that. Yeah. And being part of the independent media, you know, you recently wrote about what we as a country failed to understand about those who turned to the radical right. What do you think we need to keep in mind as we assess Trump supporters and QAnon followers who are clearly not just going to be like, oh, well, we lost. I guess we'll give our guns back now. Well, I think uh, we have to distinguish between the violent extremists, uh, like the people who participated in the um, in the Capitol riot, and the 74 million people who voted for Trump. I, I think a lot of those people haven't been given uh, a coherent explanation for what they've had been living through, not just in the last few years, but the last several decades. And I think, you know, I think it's always good for all of us as human beings, as individuals, as part of a party or a movement, whatever we might be, to look at our side of it. Clearly, uh, the Democrats have failed, and the left in general has failed to reach out to people who have genuinely suffered. And I think it's all too easy. Other than Bernie. I mean, Bernie was doing that. Sure, but Bernie, first of all, is an independent, technically. And there are some others, sure. I mean, there there are Jeff Merkley's a good guy, and, you know, we, we, we could name some other folks. But by and large, the party as a whole has not said we get it. First of all, we're storytelling animals, right? So we haven't said to people, here's the story of what's happened to you over 30 or 40 years. And the reason why the Democrats haven't done that is because they've been trying to straddle a line. Yeah, where they're they complicit, take- that's why. <laughs> yeah, well, they, they want to take corporate money with one hand and then reach out with the other hand and say to working Americans, uh, we're going to help you out. And you can't do that. So they wind up telling a convoluted story and coming up with convoluted policies. And a Trump comes along, or for that matter, other Republicans, and uh, there's no disconnect between their rhetoric and uh, and uh, uh, what they do. They they basically say, well, you know, the problem is the immigrants, these people, are, we give all this money to corporations, you'll be better off. It's nonsense, but it's a coherent story. So I, uh, I think the extremists ought to be, you know, face the full penalty of the law when they break the law. I, I don't think they're people who will come around to a better way of thinking. But I think a lot of the people who voted, 74 million people who voted for Trump deserve to hear the story of what's really happening to them. And uh, if Democratic politicians won't do it, we'll get some politicians who will. And it's not, you know, this this sort of liberal rhetoric of, uh, you know, dismissing all 74 million is a cheap and lazy way out. It, 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 if you don't believe in talking to people who don't already agree with you, then you're doomed to fail at politics. You know, you mentioned that I worked for Bernie. I saw Bernie talk one on one and in small groups with Trump voters or potential Trump voters, for example. And uh, he always talked to them with respect. He was forceful about disagreeing with them, but he listened to them. He engaged with them. If you don't want to do that, if you want to condemn all 74 million of them as racists, including the 8 to 12 percent of African-American voters who voted for them, or the larger percentage of uh, Latinx voters who voted for them, if you want to say they're all white nationalists, you know what, A, you're, you're wrong. But and, Richard, and, isn't there something, I get not condemning all of them as racism or white nationalism, but Trump is a white nationalist. So isn't supporting a white nationalist also kind of condemnable? 
If you believe that he's a white nationalist, yes. But what this is where the media part that you uh, discussed in your introduction comes in. We have had, see, oddly enough, uh, when CNN and MSNBC was has been partisan basically for the last X number of years, but uh, when CNN decided it was anti-Trump, when the Washington Post decided it was anti-Trump, they didn't tell a coherent story either, but they abandoned their own uh, pretext of neutrality. So that made it very easy for Trump voters to say, well, CNN says he's a white nationalist, but they clearly hate Trump. Uh, the New York Times says he's a white nationalist, but, but they clearly hate Trump. Washington Post says democracy dies in darkness. Well, what darkness? You know, they clearly... so. In a sense, they they took away whatever credibility they had and returned for what? An anti-Trumpism that doesn't condemn his entire racist party or its decades of suppressing the African-American vote. It, it doesn't condemn uh, you know, all the people who are engaging in economic policies that harm people of color in this country, women in this country. It's just about Trump. And then when they want to show me who they really believe in, as opposed to Trump, it's John Kasich and it's, uh, you know, Amy Klobuchar. Well, I'm sorry. You know, the fact is yeah, right. they've eroded any kind of context that would allow some of these Trump voters to realize in whoever they may be and whatever group they may belong to, it made it possible for them to dismiss the idea that Trump is a white nationalist even though he is. So given though, that, given that there's right wing talk radio and right wing, clearly partisan Fox media and then Sinclair media and everything that's happening with that, given that there's so much clear right wing media, it seems what you're saying is to fight right wing media. We don't need left wing media. We need actual, you know, centrist media. That's not necessarily corporate friendly. We well, need we actual need two, journalism. We need two things. We do need left-wing media, but I don't think MSNBC is left-wing media. Right. I think it's corporate Democrat media. And I don't think CNN is left-wing media. I think it's I think it's elite consensus media. And I think the elite consensus is what's broken down because it's failed people. And people know that, uh, you know, I remember in 2016 when I was working for Bernie and we were talking about the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership and how trade deals have hurt working people in this country. And I remember Democratic operatives saying, uh, people don't care about trade deals. They don't even understand trade deals. Go to Michigan in 2016. See the uh, the yard signs that say no TPP. Uh, go to my hometown in the Rust Belt, upstate New York, and see. Oh, the yard I'm from signs. upstate New York. Where I'm from, Syracuse. Utica. Utica. Ah! Syrac Syracuse is, is where the fancy folk live. We uh, used to drive to Utica to get Spoliadel because there was one bakery that made them better than every bakery in Syracuse. So, uh, you know, Italians from Syracuse will go far and wide for their pastry. Italian food, Polish food, we got it. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, no, Syracuse was... Uh, was the right side of the tracks for us in Utica, but um, <laughs> that's too bad. It wasn't always like that. Yeah, well, you know, um, the uh, Syracuse is where you went when you hit the big time. But anyway, um, <laughs> unless you're the, from uh, and you left for New York, yeah. But you know, so uh, the, this elite viewpoint and consensus view of the world which to me is epitomized in the vice presidential debate of 2012 when you had Mitt Romney. I'm, I'm sorry, when you, well, two things in those debates. One was in the presidential debates, Romney and Obama, and Obama saying, I suspect that Mr. Romney and I agree about Social Security, meaning to cut it. And in the vice presidential debates, you had the questioner, Martha Raddatz from ABC, saying everybody knows Social Security is going bankrupt. That, to me, is the viewpoint of the elite consensus that CNN and MSNBC uh, largely represent. And now it's moved a little bit on Social Security, but 
people don't buy it. So in that vacuum, they're going to step in. So we need real left media like you. We need, and then we need places like CNN to be what they used to be so that, and not so openly hostile uh, to anyone who is not a member of the in club because you're not going to persuade anybody. You will not have the credibility to point out Trump's repeated lies or his corruption or his uh, white nationalism because you've already showed your hand that you don't like the guy, number one, and number two, that you buy into the viewpoint that if I'm a working person, has screwed me for the last 30 years. So why should I listen to you? So I mean, MSNBC threw Ed off. Ed was the only one talking about TPP. Remember Ed? He was so wonderful. Sure. Talking about trade, talking about labor, and they got rid of him quick. Yeah, no, they didn't. They didn't want to hear it. He was also friendly to Bernie when Bernie first came along, and they didn't want to hear that either. So uh, I mean, we were talking, I was listening, if you want to, de- we're almost out of time, but if you want to dig deeper into RJ's conversation about this, you, first of all, you could read his writing, but also um, you have a great conversation with Matt Taibbi from Rolling Stone and from his podcast, Useful Idiots, on your show on YouTube. I suggest everyone watching that. On that piece, uh, Matt was saying that, you know, the, there might not be a crop of journalists who understand how to report um in a way that's not partisan because of how they've grown up over the last 20 years. I was thinking that it's been very hard to get a job if you're actually going to be reasonable because mainstream media has become this, you know, either corporatized uh, or, well, I guess mainstream equals corporatized, but both, you know, they have their, they have their lanes. So you have to find yourself in one of those lanes or you find yourself out of a job or you have to kind of put it together like you have and like I have and others have, but it, it's a hard scrabble from from nothing to building up, you know, a media presence uh, if you don't get in one of those lanes. What are your thoughts there? Well, I think that's exactly right. And I think that you also have to have a dedicated, in my view, I mean, you can you can you can find a lane for yourself by manipulating the truth. That's very easy to do nowadays and being a crowd pleaser for one side or the other. But to actually tell the truth at the same time as articulating a point of view is tough. The perfect example to me is Charlottesville. Trump said there were fine people on both sides. He went on to say, of course, the white nationalists are bad now. He was BSing at that point, right? He obviously didn't think the white nationalists were bad. But to omit that part of the sentence, you sacrifice your credibility. You have to tell the whole story and then explain that it was just misdirection. And But when so many mainstream media outlets just leave that part out, then his allies can just say, hey, look what they selectively edited. So to actually build a lane where you tell the whole story, but then put it into the right context for people who think like you and me, that's a lot harder work than just being a crowd pleasing Twitter slammer of anyone who doesn't agree with you. And that's what's missing now, I think. Yeah. And people are addicted to the the hard slams and it puts everybody in lanes. And, you know, if you say something reasonable, it gets like two clicks, you know, it doesn't, you, it's, it, the eyeballs don't go to reasonable. No, they don't. And so that's why, as Matt and I were discussing, we need a new media system that is not driven off eyeball clicks or advertiser money. Now, obviously easier said than done, but that's, I think, what all of us, like you and me, what we're all trying to do is find a new way forward where you can actually be dedicated to the truth and to justice. And if you're Superman, also to the American way, but I'll settle for truth and justice. And, um, you know, it's a it's a long haul project. But I, I think any movement that's built on just selective cherry picking of the truth is doomed to fail. I think the truth is the key to actually building something that lasts. RJ, final question. Are there um, any uh, big uh, fights coming up any uh legislation that we're looking forward to in the media sphere any media consolidation on the horizon anything that we can do to break up some of the media consolidation that's already happening 
I think a lot will have to do with who gets appointed to uh, the FCC. I think a, a lot will have to do with uh, regulations that come out about this stuff from from the point of view of those types of fights. But in the end, it's it's about fighting the profit model in journalism. And we're all going to have to build our own institutions, kind of ground up, almost uh, anarchist or collectivizing type organizing to make that happen. RJ, thank you so much for joining us. We're speaking with RJ Escal, the host of The Zero Hour on Free Speech TV and syndicated on radio. Follow RJ on Twitter at RJ Escal, E-S-K-O-W. Thanks again, RJ. I appreciate you coming on. Always a pleasure. Thank you.